Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Today we're going to start our lecture on Chapter 14, Glucose Utilization and Biosynthesis. Our learning objectives for this chapter is to learn the many steps of glycolysis, which is how we harness energy from glucose. We've already learned the structure of glucose, and now we're going to learn how we break that down into a three-carbon molecule called pyruvate and how we get energy from glucose. We'll learn about fermentation, which is that breakdown under anaerobic or conditions without oxygen. We'll learn the synthesis of glucose. Sometimes you actually need to synthesize glucose from simpler compounds and that is called gluconeogenesis. And then we'll learn about oxidation of glucose and pentose phosphate pathway. This lecture is intended for Monday, March 30th. I know it's coming right before your test, so you probably won't look at it until after you've taken your test, but I wanna get it posted just in case you have some free time and you're really anxious to learn about glycolysis. So to, in this lecture, we'll focus on uh, section 14.1 if you're following along your book. And that's how molecules are modified and energy is transferred in the breakdown of glucose. So it's the 10 steps of glycolysis. So what will you have to learn? You'll have to learn everything. You're going to have to learn the structures of the substrates. You're going to have to learn the sub, uh, structures of the products in each of these 10 steps. And also you'll have to learn the enzymes that are involved. So it's going to be a lot of structures. There'll be a lot of names you'll have to learn, but fortunately, many of those you've already learned, and I'm gonna give you some tips on how you can best memorize all the steps of glycolysis. Now, sometimes you might be wondering, why do I have to learn all the steps of glycolysis? Part of the answer is I really don't know. This is an expectation they have for you on your um, GRE, your graduating, graduate interest exams. This is an expectation they will have for you on the MCAT. This is an expectation you'll have in your first year of med school or whatever kind of school you're going to. So this might just separate you from somebody who has an issue memorizing all these steps. So um, you can learn it just for the fun of learning it. I actually think it's kind of fun to learn all the steps that are in, involved in breaking down glucose. You can learn it because you need to and you might be um, introduced to this again when you get to med school or wherever you're going, dental school, PA school. But also, there's a lot that we can learn by understanding all the steps of glycolysis. If there's a breakdown in an enzyme in one of those steps, then you will have a breakdown in your metabolism digestion of your food, and that can lead to a lot of diseases. So it is really interesting to learn about all of these steps in glycolysis because they have a lot of medical implications. Also today, we'll focus on section 14.2, which are optional ways to end glycolysis. So if we have pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule, it's the last of 10 steps in glycolysis, what are the fates of pyruvate? Because we know eventually when we get, break down glucose, the byproducts will be carbon dioxide and water. So how do we get from the three carbon molecule of pyruvate to just the byproduct, which is carbon dioxide and water? So we'll briefly look at what are the fates of pyruvate after we're done with glycolysis. So glucose was chosen as a central molecule for extracting energy from carbohydrates. We'll learn that all of our other carbohydrates that we learned about sucrose or lactose or galactose or fructose all get converted into glucose and then follow through with the glycolysis pathway. So why is glucose so important? Well, it's an excellent fuel. It yields a good amount of energy upon oxidation it can be efficiently stored in the polymeric form. So we've seen that already, that we have glucose. 
Glucose can form the polysaccharides of starch, which is amylose and amylopectin, and also glycogen, which we store in our liver. Many organisms and tissues can meet all their energy needs with glucose. Glucose is also a versatile biochemical precursor. Bacteria can use glucose to build their carbon skeletons of all their amino acids. They can use it to incorporate into their membrane lipids. They can use it as a precursor for nucleotides such as DNA and RNA. And they can also use it as cofactors needed for the metabolism. So bacteria can use only glucose as their source of energy and make all the important macromolecules that they need. You should be familiar with all the major pathways of glucose utilization, meaning what happens to glucose, what are the fates of glucose in the body. So the first one you should be familiar with, and you're already familiar with, is glucose is a storage molecule. So this would be number one. When there's plenty of excess energy, glucose can be stored in polymeric form. So we already know in our body, it can be stored as glycogen, so we can use it later. In a plant, it can be stored as starch, also sucrose, like sugar cane. So one of the fates of glucose, when we eat too much glucose, it can be stored as glycogen for energy for later or it can be stored as starch or sucrose in plants. Our short-term energy needs are met by oxidation of glucose via glycolysis. So we take the glucose, if we need energy from the glucose, it gets broken down in the, in the glycolysis pathway, and then we get a three carbon molecule called pyruvate. The third way that glucose can be utilized is the pentose phosphate pathway. We'll talk about that very briefly, but we can generate from that NADPH, which is an energy molecule or energy currency molecule very similar to ATP. So that's one of the fates of glucose. Or our last fate of glucose that you should be familiar with is a structural polysaccharide, uh oh, a structural polysaccharide that we will see in bacteria or in fungi, and they can use that to make up their cell walls or their cell membranes. So these are the four different utilizations of glucose that you should become familiar with. One, as a storage molecule, glycogen, starch, or sucrose. Two, what we'll be learning about today is the oxidation via glycolysis or how it's broken down to give us energy and turns into a three-carbon molecule called pyruvate. It can yield an energy-yielding molecule called NADPH in the pentose phosphate pathway or in bacteria and fungi and some plants it can build up their cell wall. Now to learn about glycolysis. Glycolysis comes from the Greek word glykis, which means sweet, and lysis, which means splitting. So we're splitting up or breaking down a sweet molecule, glucose. We start with one molecule of glucose, which has six carbons and eventually it's broken down into two molecules of pyruvate, which each have three carbons. It happens in two phases. First, the preparatory phase requires two molecules of ATP, so we're putting in energy in the first five steps, which is the preparatory phase. And then in the payoff phase, we end up with four molecules of ATP and two molecules of NADH. So for our net equation of energy, we actually only yield two molecules of ATP and two molecules of NADH. The oxidation of glucose gives us a lot of energy. Actually, the complete oxidation of glucose to CO2 and H2O has a delta G prime knot 
of negative 2,870 kilojoules per mole. So it gives us a lot of energy. But if we just talk about glycolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose to pyruvate, we see a delta G of negative 146 kilojoules per mole. So only 5.2% of the potential energy in glucose has been liberated. So that's why we learn about the other pathways to get energy out of glucose. The first pathway we're going to learn about today is glycolysis. It only gives us 5.2% uh, of our potential energy. But stage two, the citric acid cycle, is called the Krebs cycle, it's called the TCA cycle, that's chapter 16, we'll get a lot more energy out of those two molecules of pyruvate. And actually most of our energy or most of the ATP that we're going to yield comes in stage three, which is oxidative phosphorylation. It's a kind of complicated pathway that we'll go over briefly in chapter 19. To learn the 10 steps of glycolysis, I'm going to try as best we can on a recorded lecture to have an interactive lecture. So if you don't have one beside you right now, pause it and go get a sheet of paper and a pen. So we're going to work through the steps of glycolysis, learning them right here, right now, together, so it won't be so overwhelming. Right, so hopefully now you've got your sheet of paper and I want you to number them for the steps of glycolysis 1 to 10. There are 10 steps. That means there are at least 10 reactants. There are at least 10 products and there are at least 10 enzymes that you're going to have to learn. And we're going to try learning these by learning the names of the enzymes and then making guesses or educated guesses about what reactants and what products would actually take or would actually be catalyzed by these enzymes. So I'll try to draw it on here. It's going to be really sloppy because I don't have an iPad. I just have this silly mouse. But I want you to just label down the sheet of paper. Step one, we know that step one is going to start with glucose, and you draw the structure of glucose. Of course, I'm not going to try to draw it. All right, so this is our first reactant. Step one is going to have an enzyme. It's going to lead to a product, and then you would draw, you know, steps one through ten. And our last step, step ten, I'm showing you here, is going to have the product pyruvate. So you can draw the structure that's shown here, a pyruvate. And I won't try to draw the structure because I can't even write. All right, so we're going to fill in all of these spaces, all of the substrates or reactants, all of the enzymes, all of the products, and once you learn one product, it'll be the reactant for the next step. So the 10 steps of glycolysis, one at a time, learning it as best we can right here in this lecture. The first enzyme that you're gonna write on your paper for step one is hexokinase. The name of the first enzyme is hexokinase. Many times we will put the name of the enzyme right above the reaction arrow if we're thinking of these steps as reactions. So we're going to learn the steps in glycolysis by memorizing the names of the enzymes and predicting what the reactants and products are from the types of reactions these enzymes might catalyze. So if I tell you the enzyme name is hexokinase, well, we already know that the first reactant is glucose. So the first reactant is glucose. Here's the structure of glucose. You already know the structure of glucose. Well, what type of reaction is being catalyzed by hexokinase? Well, we see hexo, that means six. So it's a six carbon sugar. Well, glucose is already up there. It's not called glucokinase, most likely because 
it can catalyze reactions or bind to other six carbon sugar, sugars, hexoses. But what does the kinase do? If you remember from the chapter in biosignaling, kinases, they move phosphate groups. So they take a phosphate group from one structure or one molecule and place it on another. So this kinase is going to do what kinases do. They move phosphates from one thing to the other thing. So where do they usually take phosphates from? ATPs. So our other substrate, our other reactant is going to be ATP. So our for first reaction, we're going to have hexokinase catalyzing the transfer of one phosphate from ATP onto glucose. And that's going to create another molecule, our product. So then you have to decide, well, this phosphate is going to be transferred from ATP to my glucose molecule. It's going to add it to one of the oxygens on one of the carbons of glucose. So can you think about what's the most likely um, oxygen it's going to be transferred to? You have six choices, one, two, three, four, five, or six. It's going to be transferred to carbon number six. That to me kind of makes sense because it's the carbon that's kind of an oxygen that's kind of sticking out there by itself and easy to take a phosphate transfer. So the product of the first reaction is glucose 6-phosphate. Sometimes we call it G6P. So I'll write that on there. The abbreviation that you should learn is G6P. So we have hexokinase catalyzing the transfer of phosphate, because it's a kinase, from ATP to the 6 carbon of glucose. So if our reactants are glucose and ATP, one of our products is G6P, glucose 6 phosphate, but then what happened to ATP? It turned into, I'll put it over here, ADP. Oh, that looks funny. ADP. All right, so this scribbly stuff is the first reaction in glycolysis. Hexokinase is the first enzyme. It's a kinase, so it transfers a phosphate to the glucose. Which carbon on the glucose? The sixth one, because it's sticking out there by itself. And our product is glucose 6-phosphate, or G6P, plus ADP. Here we have the first step of glycolysis. Hexokinase is responsible for phosphorylating glucose molecule with ATP. We're forming ADP in eukaryotes. Um, it's called hexokinase, but in prokaryotes, it's called glucokinase. The mechanism you don't have to learn, but there's a nucleophilic oxygen at C6, and it attacks the last phosphorus of ATP. So we end up with ADP and glucose 6 phosphate. You notice here that the delta G prime knot is negative 16.7 kilojoules per mole, so a relatively high negative number or largely negative number for the reaction. So the reaction is irreversible. It only goes in one direction. Once we phosphorylate the glucose, it doesn't uh, go back into forming glucose. It stays as glucose 6-phosphate. The magnesium you don't have to worry about, but it facilitates the process by stabilizing the transition state. 
and we just use our first molecule of ATP. So remember that in the preparatory phase, we use ATPs, but we're going to get some energy from ATP back in our second phase. The second enzyme in, involved in glycolysis is called phosphohexose isomerase. So we're starting out with glucose 6-phosphate, G6P, from our, our product from our first step, and now it's the reactant in our second step. And we have an isomerase. It's catalyzing a reaction that's going to isomerize a phosphohexose. What's the phosphohexose? G6P. So if we think about a phosphohexose isomerase, what does our other substrate or reactant have to be? I'll write it right here. Plus nothing. We don't need another reactant because it's an isomerase. It's going to actually just isomerize the G6P. So what is another um, carbohydrate or monosaccharide that we're familiar with that's most likely for it to turn to? It's going to be F6P. So now we've created F6P fructose 6-phosphate. So we're going from an aldose to a ketose. So you don't actually need to worry too much about the uh, reaction details or the reaction mechanism. But I'll give you an overview of what happens. First, we have the binding of the glucose 6-phosphate to our phosphohexoisomerase. The ring opens up. A proton is extracted by glutamate. The glutamate general acid facilitates the F6P formation and then it dissociates and the ring closes. What you should notice here is we have a delta G prime knot. Oh wait, let me put this here. An L, a delta G prime knot is 1.7 kilojoules per mole. So that tells us that the delta G prime knot is very close to zero, so it's a completely reversible reaction. So you will have the glucose 6-phosphate turning into fructose 6-phosphate, and it can go back and form glucose 6-phosphate. Step three utilizes the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1 it's usually abbreviated PFK1. So we start out with our reactant fructose 6-phosphate, which was the product from step two, and we're utilizing a phosphofructokinase. So our phosphofructose is F6P, and it's a kinase, so it's gonna do what kinases do. And what do kinases do? They transfer a phosphate group to the substrate. So we need another reactant where they usually take a phosphate from ATP. So we have F6P plus ATP. It's catalyzed by the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1. And then, of course, we're going to get a doubly phosphorylated um, fructose in the end. So now we have two cho uh, six choices. Actually, no, we have five choices. We're going to phosphorylate another oxygen on a different carbon. So we already have phosphorylated carbon number six. So we're going to phosphorylate one of these other carbons, one, two, three, four, and five. So we're going to end up with fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So we say that we have a bisphosphate because we have had have a phosphate on two different carbons. If we think about ADP or ATP, it's triphosphate. All the phosphates are on one oxygen. Diphosphate, I didn't say diphosphate, have both of the phosphates on the same oxygen. But when it's 
bisphosphate, we have a phosphate on two different oxygens on two different carbons. So we go from fructose 6-phosphate, we must utilize an ATP, so we've utilized two ATPs, and we have created fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and of course we have created an ADP. This mechanism uses, utilizes a magnesium 2 plus as well. So um, ATP is the donor of the second phosphate. It's an irreversible step. It has a largely negative, I don't know if you can see that, but it has a largely negative delta G prime knot. The product fructose one fifth phosphate is committed to become pyruvate and yield energy. So once we've created fructose one six bisphosphate, it's gonna go through glycolysis and give us pyruvate and yield energy energy. We'll talk about the regulation of fructose 1,6, uh, sorry, the regulation of PFK1 at a later time. The fourth step involved in glycolysis utilizes the enzyme called aldolase. So aldolase does not really help you understand what's going on in the reaction, so we'll just skip the guessing game and say that aldolase is responsible for cleaving the aldol, the aldol in this case is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate from step three, into two three-carbon molecules. The first one is called dihydro dihydroxyacetone phosphate. A lot of times you'll see that abbreviated as DHAP, so I'll just call it usually DHAP. So you should try to know the structure of DHAP. And the second three carbon molecule is called GAP or glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Sometimes you people will call it G3P or many other things, but it's easier for me to remember GAP and DHAP. So aldolase cleaves fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into DHAP and GAP. And we see from our delta G prime knot, it's very positive. So it's a reversible reaction at cellular con concentrations. Um, animal and plant aldolases employ covalent catalysis. So that's all you should know about the reaction they use a metal ion, so we've seen magnesium used in all our other reactions. This one also utilizes a metal ion as well as a lysine in the active site. Although you are not responsible for this enzyme mechanism, it is interesting to note that all of our enzymes in our glycolytic pathway have their own unique mechanisms. And so aldolase, which is the fourth step in glycolysis, is a, is a specific type of enzyme. It's a class one aldolase, and all our aldolases in class one have similar mechanisms. So I'll briefly just go over some of the things that might happen in this mechanism which again, you're not responsible for learning, but it is kind of interesting to see that the mechanisms are different, but they're all similar in a certain class of enzymes. So you start with fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. It binds to an aldolase in the active site. We've seen something like this before when we talked about chymotrypsin. It binds in the active site. The lysine attacks the substrate carbonyl carbon and then we'll have rearrangement, formation of a shift base. We have the release of our first product. And since the covalent, it's a covalent catalysis, we have our second product still covalently bound to the enzyme. And then through a series of steps, we must release the second product. So involved in this, what you should know is that lysine acts as a base and then we have uh, covalent catalysis where one product is released and then the second product is released.
The fifth step utilizes triose phosphate isomerase. So now from step four, we created two different three carbon molecules, the GAP and the DHAP. Step five is starting solely with dihydroxyacetone phosphate, one of the three carbon molecules. And so if we know how our enzyme naming works, we have an isomerase. It's going to catalyze the isomerization of a triose phosphate, DHAP, into GAP. So we know in the end we're going to get two molecules of pyruvate. So at this step, when we've created, um, at step four, when we've created DHAP and GAP, step five is the conversion of one of the molecules of DHAP to GAP. And so now we have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. I usually just call it GAP. So we've created two. Um, first, we had two triose phosphates. Now we have two of the same triose phosphates. And this is a reversible reaction because it has a delta G prime zero that is positive. This marks the end of the preparatory phase. The preparatory phase in which we've utilized two ATPs, but we have not gotten any energy back from ATP. Breaking glycolysis down into two phases, we've just went over the preparatory phase, which utilizes two ATPs, has not given us energy, but we'll get some energy back in our second phase. So we utilize five enzymes. Hexokinase is a kinase, so it's going to take a phosphate from the ATP and add to uh, glucose. Then we utilize phosphohexose isomerase, so we go from G6P to F6P. And then our third enzyme we utilize was phosphofructokinase. It's a kinase, so it's going to take a, a phosphate from ATP and add it to F6P. Now we have F16BP or fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then we have aldolase. Aldolase is going to be responsible for cleaving an aldol into two three carbon molecules, both with a phosphate. And then our fifth enzyme utilized is triose phosphate isomerase. So we have two different three carbon molecules, GAP and DHAP, and we're going to convert the DHAP to GAP. So at the end of the preparatory phase, we're going to have two molecules of glyceride, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now that we're done with the preparatory phase, before we get into the five steps in the payoff phase, I'm going to introduce two new redox cofactors that have the potential to carry energy just like ATP, and they are NAD plus and NADP plus. They're usually called pyridine nucleotides. You know what a nucleotide is. It has a nitrogenous base. It has a ribose sugar and a phosphate. So we see that in the structure. No, no, no. You do not have to learn the structure of NAD or NADP. But you do know a lot about the structure already. Um, they have an adenine. So we see nicot nicotinamide adenosine um, phosphate. So we have an adenine here. We have our ribose sugar for NAD+. If it's NADP, this um, hydroxyl group on carbon-2 is esterified to a phosphate, but that's the only difference in the two structures. And then we have two phosphate groups connected to an, a nicotinamide group. So it's very similar to like adenine monophosphate, but we have this extra nicotinamide group here. They can dissociate from the enzyme after the reaction, and in a temple oxi typical oxidation reaction, the hydride from an alcohol is transferred to the NAD+. So we see the two electrons get transferred to our nicotinamide structure, and then they give NADH. So everything is the same.
we just had a transfer of a hydrogen from one structure to our NAD plus structure, our NADP plus structure. And then we have the reduced form, which is NADH or NADPH. And NADH or NADPH um, have very similar roles as ATP or GTP or something like that. They carry a lot of electrical potential or potential energy. Hopefully you still have your pen and paper out as we uh, continue to predict the reactants and products from the names of our enzymes and the steps of glycolysis. So step six utilizes the enzyme um, GA3P or GAP dehydrogenase. So we have the reactant as the product from our last reaction or our last step, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So we have two of these, two three carbon sugars that both have a phosphate group on them. We're utilizing a GAP dehydrogenase. And so if you remember, a dehydrogenase is classified as an oxidoreductase, if you remember the six classifications of enzymes. So an oxidoreductase is going to transfer a proton or a hydride from one molecule to the other. So I foreshadow what the other product, or the other reactant or substrate is when we talked about NADH and NAD. So since this is a payoff phase, we're actually going to yield energy carrying molecules or molecules with energy potential such as ATP or NADH or NADPH. So the other reactant in this step is going to be NAD plus. Ugh, that looks awful. NAD plus. And since we know that we are going to be yielding um, molecules that carry energy, our energy carrier mo um, currency molecules, in the end we're going to create an NADH molecule. So we're going to have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate plus NAD+, plus, which you actually cannot predict from the name of the enzyme, is that we're also going to add an inorganic phosphate. So we're going to add phosphate as our other substrate. So we have the, our dehydrogenase. It's going to catalyze a reaction where we're going to um, move a hydride from a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to NAD plus to give our NADH. And we're also going to add a phosphate to our substrate. So we have to add that phosphate somewhere. There are three choices. There's carbon 1, carbon 2, or carbon 3 on the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. What we're actually going to do is add that phosphate to carbon 1 and yield a molecule called 1,3-bisphosphate. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, sorry. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So that phosphate, you circle this right here, Ugh. It's going to come right here and add itself to carbon 1. So you have a phosphate in carbon 1 and carbon 3. So here is the full reaction of step 3 utilizing GA3P 
dehydrogenase. This is dehydrogenase. So we're going to add a hydride to NAD plus and get NADH plus H plus. We are also utilizing an inorganic phosphate. That phosphate has to be added to one of the three carbons and it's going to be added to carbon one. So we have a phosphate group on carbon one. And we already had a phosphate group on carbon three. So the product of this reaction is 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 1,3-BPG. I'll write that down. So you can um, abbreviate it as 1,3-BP and G. This is our payoff phase. So we have our first energy yielding step. We get an NADH. The reaction itself is reversible. We see a positive delta G prime knot. Oxidation of the aldehyde with NAD plus, we get an NADH. Phosphorylation yields a carboxylic acid anhydride with a phosphate. And dehydrogenase covalently binds in the mechanism to gap to a cysteine residue forming a thiohemiacetal. So what you should know from this that it's a covalent catalysis and it involves a cysteine residue. Covalently binds, so a covalent co catalysis involving a cysteine. Step seven in glycolysis utilizes the enzyme phosphoglycerate kinase. So phosphoglycerate, our 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate here is our reactant, and we're utilizing a kinase. Remember what kinases do? They usually transfer phosphates from ATP to our substrate molecule. So in this case, we need another substrate, and it's green, plus ADP. Now I just said that uh, kinases transfer phosphates from ATP to another molecule. This one is a little tricky because we're in our payoff phase. So what we're going to get in the end is our energy um, molecules ATP or maybe NADH. And so this um, enzyme is named for the, react, the reverse reaction because this is a, a reversible reaction. So this step or this enzyme is named because the reaction goes in the other direction. And we get the naming from the fact that the ATP that's formed as a product can actually be taken off and move to create 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. All right, so we know it's the kinase. We know it's the payoff phase. So now we're going to utilize ADP and actually transfer a phosphate from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to ADP and then get ATP at the end. And it's named for the reverse reaction. So we have a couple choices. We're going to take off one phosphate. We can take it off from carbon one or carbon three. So you got a 50-50 shot of figuring out which carbon we're going to take off that phosphate from. Hopefully, if you were guessing the product, you guessed it right. The 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is going to donate the phosphate from carbon one to ADP and we're going to get an ATP because we're in the payoff phase so we get a high um, energy ATP and we create three phosphoglycerates. So 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is a high energy product that can actually donate a phosphate to ADP to make ATP. It is reversible at cellular conditions and this, in, uh, this reaction is named for the reverse reaction and it's the first example of substrate level phosphorylation that we see uh, phosphorylation coming from the substrate actually to ADP
to make ATP. The eighth step utilizes the enzyme phosphoglycerate mutase. So we started, we're starting out with 3-phosphoglycerate from our last step, and we're going to utilize a mutase. So this is just going to be a isomerization. So we go from 3-phosphoglycerate, utilizing our mutase, to move the phosphate from carbon-3 to carbon-2 and create 2-phosphoglycerate. It's a completely reversal reaction. The delta G prime 9 is 4.4 kilojoules per mole. Enzymes that shift phosphor groups around are called mutases. So we have isomerases and mutases are involved in shifting phosphor groups around. And then eventually we're going to involve the 2,3 bisphosphoglycerate intermediate. Recall that 2,3 BPG was talked about in the hemoglobin discussion. So when you're going through glycolysis, during this step, utilizing the mutase from 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate, you're going to have an intermediate called 2,3-BPG. So if you have an abundance of 2,3-PG, that means you are going through glycolysis and you need a lot of oxygen. So that's where this 2,3-BPG comes up again way back from when we talked about hemoglobin. So a very interesting um, connection there. You should know that it involves a key histidine residue, but you don't actually have to know the mechanism, but you should know that it involves a key histidine residue. You don't actually have to know all the details of the mechanism of phosphoglycerate mutase, but I want to just go over it briefly just to emphasize the importance of 2,3-BPG because it's involved in actually the transition state of the R state to the T state of hemoglobin, which we talked about a long time ago. So you have 3-phosphoglycerate here. It has, of course, a phosphate on the third carbon, or the third oxygen on the third carbon. And then we have a post-translationally modified phosphohistidine. So histidine here actually already has a phosphate group on it. So the phosphor transfer between the active site histidine, which has a phosphate group on it, to the C2, the hydroxyl group of C2, creates 2,3-BPG. So when you're creating a lot of 2,3-BPG, that means you're going through a lot of glycolysis and you have high energy needs and that triggers the release of oxygen from hemoglobin. So this is just an intermediate step. Once you have 2,3-BPG, that histidine is going to be rephosphorylated. So we're going to take the phosphate off the 2,3-BPG the and put it back on the histidine and create 2-phosphoglycerate. The ninth step is catalyzed by the enzyme enolase, and there's no help from the enzyme name here. So I'll just tell you to memorize that we just went um, from 1,3-BPG to 2-phosphoglycerate. The enzyme is enolase, and we get uh, phosphoenolpyruvate. So phospho phosphoenolpyruvate is sometimes called PEP. And it's a very energetic molecule. And the goal here is to create a better phosphor donor, donor to set up the final energy yielding step. So we've created PEP to set us up uh, to create pyruvate. It's a reversible um, elimination addition reaction. And PEP hydrolysis product, which is pyruvate, which is the last step, is further stabilized by tautomerization. The last step in glycolysis, step 10, is catalyzed by the enzyme pyruvate kinase. So you kind of got the, the gist of things. It's a kinase, and it's going to catalyze a reaction that's going to transfer a phosphate group from PEP, because we just created PEP as our product in the last reaction. So we have PEP here, 
we have a kinase. So kinase uses transfer phosphates to or from ATP. And since we are in our payoff phase, we're going to actually take that phosphate off of PEP and put it onto ADP. And then we're going to get ATP here in our last product, which is pyruvate. So we've gone through all, I'm oh, sorry, all of that, all of those steps to get two molecules, remember, of pyruvate because it was a six carbon glucose and we broke it up into two molecules of GAP and now we get two molecules of pyruvate. And it's called a kinase because we, we it's a, a reaction that is going to transfer a phosphate group, but now we're transferring the phosphate group from PEP to ADP to get our energy molecule ATP and two molecules of pyruvate. And since this happens twice, we get two molecules of ATP for every reaction because we have two three carbon molecules. And the tautomerization of pyruvate effectively lowers the concentration of their reaction products and drives the reaction towards ATP formation. So we're going to have an almost re irreversible reaction in creating pyruvate because of tautomerization. This is the second substrate level phosphorylation and the final energy building step in glycolysis. Now we've gone through all 10 steps of glycolysis. Remember in the last five steps, the payoff phase, some of the enzymes are, are named for the reverse reaction, but we're going to get high energy molecules or molecules that have an energy potential such as NADH and ATP. So first we have uh, our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So dehydrogenase, so that's the step that's going to involve um, getting NAD plus and then creating NADH, we also are going to add a phosphate and get 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. In step seven, our phosphoglycerate kinase is going to take off one of those phosphates and give us an ATP. Our phosphoglycerate mutase is going to just mutate the molecule into um, a very similar molecule. Then we have enolase. And then we have pyruvate kinase that's going to create a second ATP. And remember that this is happening twice because um, we have two molecules that are of gap that have been created in phase one. So we get two ATPs and we, uh, for one step, we get two ATPs for another step and we get two NADHs because we have two gap molecules going through this process. All right, so we've been through all the steps of, of glycolysis. I hope you learned something. I hope you are starting to memorize all these steps because these will be very helpful for you in the future. We hopefully, I have a song here that we may can sing together on next Friday. It's to the tune of my favorite things. And if you don't know that sound, try to look it up and we will sing this song and it details all the steps of glycolysis together on Friday. All right, I'll see you next time. Good luck on your tests. Make sure you bring me any questions that you have and God's blessings to you. Say bye, Seth. No, all right, bye-bye.